Nick Klein's going to do a bunch of uh, intros. Make your way. There's The bathrooms are in the back towards my right. There's some beer over here. Welcome to it. Um, and yeah. I'm going to pass the mic to, to Nick Klein. All right. Hello, and thank you all for being here. It's amazing to see so many old friends. I feel like we're in Florida. Uh, TV. It's interesting. Uh, so many people that have been so <clears throat> very kind uh, and generous to me over the years. Uh, it's nice to see everybody here. Um, thank you. And today at the exhibition that we have here today, uh, Bring the Flowers to the Theater, um, I'm, I'm very emotively pleased uh, to get to invite these two people here, Patricia Margarita Hernandez and Domingo Castillo, who ran uh, the end spring break along with two other friends. Catherine Marks and Kiwi Farah. Exactly. And it's particularly special for me to get to invite them here because uh, many years ago, when I had moved to Miami uh, from West Palm Beach, I was, due to a number of factors, not able to uh, continue education. And at that time, it was extremely precarious uh, but I was able to offset and sort of uh, wash away this kind of ex existential problem uh, with the help of uh, these people. Uh, the project was absolutely life-changing. I got to work through a number of embarrassing uh, artistic ideas um, in an extremely welcoming environment where there was not a binary of pass or fail, uh, but more so something that was rooted in exchange. And that was extremely transformative for me. I also got to party a lot. And uh, it was, it was life-changing. So it's extremely, yeah, it's very emotional to even be doing this right now. Uh, thank you for being here, you two. If you could go ahead and I guess reintroduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the, some context in the project. For sure, and, and just to kind of step back a little bit, everybody here has been to Sarah's, I hope, and this amazing show that's inaugurating this space. Um, and I also want to highlight the sound that we are listening to that I would love um, Domingo to talk a little bit about it. It's uh, essentially field recordings of different talks, um, yeah. raves, and yeah, it's whatnot. Like basically, but, yeah. hold on. Let me let me. Con yeah. I want to contextualize it for a second. Um, so I think today we're going to be talking about this space that we ran from 2009 to 2015, and so we called it was called the End Spring Break, and we doubled. We would switch names, and therefore changing kind of like an ethos of our performance of our programming um and i think what's interesting is like we're going to be reviewing documentation and you know essentially talking about some of like miami in general as an arts city and also the space itself and how it documents a city in, at a certain particular time and then tying it to these field recordings that to, that we got to start this evening off with I wanted Domingo to share a little bit about those. And they were recorded in Miami, so kind of referencing back to this, like, a same type of genre or context. Cool. So uh, those recordings that we just listened to were all built out of a 26-hour library that I was able to compile over the last year and a half of different parties, walks, traffic, public transit um, throughout the city. So like some of the recordings are like three hours, like two hours long, three hours long. And it's just like a whole spectrum of like dynamics that then I just used a number of uh, kind of instruments on that people made for Max for Live and and just built, just sound designed it and then just exported audio. Yeah. Okay. So I think the first thing I want to start off with is what is Miami and why Miami? Um, so if you can 
And um, so I'm, I know all of you know where Miami is. Most of I see a lot of Miami faces here. But I think it's also important to like really situate it, right? Like I think you can. I think most of us know Miami through our Basel Miami Beach, right? And and I think the cliche that is our Basel Miami Beach furthers that, right? We got Miami Vice. We have um, what are some other spectacular cliches? Uh, who else filmed? Miami it? Subs. Scarface. Scarface. Yeah. Thank you. Mister Three Hundred Five. Mister Three Hundred Five. Oh, but I love What's Mr. the puppet? 305. Puppet? No, no one um, knows the puppet. Uh, no, uh, no, that's, yeah. <laughs> no one knows the puppet. Yeah, yeah. They should. <laughs> so, I mean, this is like the context that we're working from, right? And we're also working from a space where like higher education, especially within the arts, especially within contemporary art, is lacking. And I and to like both Domingo and myself, I can speak for us to a certain degree. And please chime in, obviously, when you want to. You know, Understanding these two contradictions, or really uh, how they relate with each other, and you can you can next next line it, and what we're looking at is a city underwater, right? Where it's like, essentially, a, it's being funneled with money, and we're faced with like climate catastrophe, and and it, to this day we once a month it just even with the rot, like the full moon, the tides ride, you know, we have and it's water from all sides, even from below, so. I mean, and then we're seeing like, you can next line it. Um, next line it, I'm gonna just pause here. Um, so then what we're seeing is like high rises being built at like an astrom astronomical rate. And I mean, what we all know about gentrification, right? Everybody's being pushed out, you know, outside money's coming in, hence our Basel, right? We wanna, you know, hit the um, money from Latin America and Central America. Um, and then in that sense, when I now when I'm pausing on thinking about Latin America and Central America and the Caribbean, that's like who we're surrounded by and who we're in conversation with. And and that's uh, to a certain degree for me the beauty of Miami, right? Is that and I think, you know, you can say similar things to, to New York as well, right? And but New York has a history, a very well documented history of these different collectives, artist collectives, different movements within the different cities you know, and, and whatnot. I think Miami, what it has is it doesn't have that like history. So, you know, and in school, enter like undergrad, right? You, I finished undergrad and realized it's like really hard to move. Like I didn't even understand like what I was doing. And I realized that the certain conversations I was having, having with my peers were m fundamentally more, um, I learned more in those conversations than I really was learning in school. And that's when Domingo and I, and Kiwi, Farah, started this space. And we hit this like really prime time like moment where developers were developing all different parts of Miami and were looking for artists to fill. And it was like a perfect, like perfect sick relationship that just like we became you know, essentially a tool, but putting that moment aside, um, we really worked with developers. We had spaces, and now I'm just kind of talking about the structure of it, right? We had spaces for one day, we had spaces for six months, sometimes we had a project that we pitched, sometimes we got a space first. Um, and just to kind of give you a breath now, I think, please, if you want yeah. to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to jump in too. Um, just to kind of give you a breadth of like what we were doing, we did, I mean, we took advantage of everything from, I don't know, you can probably name the list. Yeah, we were doing film screenings that, uh, oh yeah, the other thing about this space is that we had no money. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was very much... That really big thing. Yeah, yeah. there was no money <laughs> involved and we purposely kind of mapped out the resources available, which is why we hit developers we would like yeah. hit them up for space because this is also something that a generation of artists before us were like you know riding this wave of having like free studios for like 15 years um and and just living off that so then we would kind of like reach out to those same developers borrow space and yeah use you know patty had a studio and in, in this warehouse so we would just use the downstairs we would borrow a uh, Gallerist's space in the evening. We went to a friend's apartment. Um, we would put a generator outside and throw a show. My mom's generator. 
Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, so the other thing that happened is that if we wanted to screen a movie, for example, Carlos had a projector. Yeah. Exactly. And we would just hit up Carlos and borrow his projector. Um, there was another space or, across town that had chairs, so we would go take those chairs, borrow them, use them, return them the next day. And this is kind of like how we mapped out uh, resources to kind of help others make what they wanted to do. And then, yeah, and just to kind yeah. of like close that, it's like that is really, in that sense, it, it was a space that was for in support of the artists, the local contemporary artists in the area and it was they supported us we supported them and in that sense we really built a, like a really strong sense of community in Miami um, and for us it was like it was a, a, a project to a certain degree about care you yeah. know and how do we care for a city essentially that we didn't feel care for us right you know you have this like everybody's prepping for this art Basel moment this happens all throughout the year and how do we develop as artists, right? How do we kind of continue to foster growth and development in ways that sit outside like a commercial gallery? And even we had some alternative art spaces at the time, but like even those were felt to a certain degree, they were bringing out artists from the outside, which I think is great. And they were, they were still vectored to like a professionalized presentation a of art. Yeah. yeah, just a total yeah. professionalized model of art that we just were not interested in. You talked about this sort of mutual support, uh, this collectivity. Um, I think something that, that I wanted to sort of clarify before we go on is sort of the modality of the exhibitions themselves or the events. We're not talking about showing up, here's my paintings or my performance. It, there's sort of things that surrounded one's practice, right? That was more highlighted often as a way to sort of supplement and create an experiential conversation rather than Here's my rarefied self-expression, boom. Yeah, I mean, so we would just uh, kind of pick people's brains because everyone that was making artwork was interested in all these other things that kind of like became the material of their work. So we were interested in all this research that they had done and all this kind of excess material that doesn't necessarily come out in the work. And yeah, just kind of like show that or do, do something with that and like create a platform for that to, to make sense. Yeah. yeah, and I think I wanna further that in the sense that um, like going back to like a history, right? Like going back to precedent, we ourselves weren't entirely familiar with like a precedent. Like I can't sit here and tell you like, oh my God, we were doing like radical pedagogy and I was like the best curator. Like I can't say any of that because I had no idea what any of that meant. Like I was learning as I was going. We were learning as we were going. And I think for me that was like the really important part. And what we weren't interested in doing is replicating what we were already seeing. You know, so it's like we weren't interested in just like a talk about you know someone's art practice we are interested in about the references we are interested more in about like especially like if there was a film that someone talked about we would screen it like we or yeah, if, just mining mining every every possible um and how to understand information and history differently like rather than it being super straightforward in a linear manner it was more about like well it'd be interesting if we pair like this, you know, and I keep going back to the film because it's easiest. Or th this film, this dancer with these sets of musicians because they're really doing some cool stuff. And we, Miami's beautiful. The outdoors is great. Why don't we just step it outside and have a matinee type feel of, of an event? Yeah. I, I wanted to ask as well, uh, you knew the models that you were not interested in, in locally or not interested in, but you were trying to create something additive. Uh, what what sort of locally like obviously there's like a history of things that globally were predecessors or like set precedent but like were there things locally just since we're on the record that were of inspiration and that did feel uh generative to y'all's process uh, at least for me it was the music and the way that if anyone wanted to listen to something you had to start a band and do that thing because there wasn't anyone touring or if someone did tour, it would, it, you know, they would have to have a certain um, 
yeah, it would it would be like a mega star, and it would just not be any kind of like interesting bands have like because of the geography, yeah, because of yeah, its yeah. locality, its distance from places and things like this. And then maybe to center that in a place, like I would say, Carlos Rogal running general practice um, was, and that was like a hybrid. I mean, you could probably say it better than I can, but it was like essentially a hybrid. Um, you would do a bunch of sound shows meets exhibitions and different talks and programs and i think that also was um a definitely source of reference um yeah i mean and then there was artists like kevin arrow who is um of like an older generation and he would tell us about like you know as i know for, for those who know miami ocean drive like south beach you know, what we know of it now wasn't what it was like in the 70s and 80s. It was actually quite punk rock and there was a bunch of artists there from, from like, you know, DJs to drag queens to different artist collectives. And he would, you know, essentially tell us a lot about that. And then... Yeah, and the thing is like, this isn't something that... This was like learning on the... On the fly. Yeah, learning on the Because we would have an event would... with Kevin, let's say, talking about this stuff like oh he would tell us a little story we'd be like okay let's we need to let's you need to share this with everybody you know so and the next two days we would spend setting it up and usually we were on the fly like that it was like we'd find a night like Kevin would tell us a story about like South Beach in the 70s and then we would do like two days later we'd be having a talk about South Beach in the 70s you can yeah. set this yeah. one up if you want what this thing yeah. I don't know do you have a I'm gonna just throw it back to Nick what are you going to throw back to me? I don't know. Was Do there a local? I mean, I, I mean, you know, I think, I think that there's a necessity down there that I noticed. Even being from some place that was less metropolitan, like a place like West Palm Beach, when I got to Miami, it seemed as though there was. Uh, it felt like a really large city, and with that, you know, there's these rich histories. I mean, we talked earlier today, uh, Domingo and I, we spoke about uh, Adalberto Delgado, uh, but then I also think of somebody like Rat Bastard, who also had a venue and gallery space on what is now uh, Lincoln Road or something. You know, uh, this kind of thing, this kind of history. I, I just think it's interesting because there's this kind of library or... Um, archival component sort of mapping the histories of things that is crucial to what y'all did. And it's interesting to hear that it kind of became, I hate to keep using this word over and over again, but like generative as it was happening. So, yeah. You know. So for example, this event, we got invited to do programming at the Miami art museum. And one of the things that Carlos again had mentioned Ye like a year prior was this if we can ever get a boat and just screen a gear of the wrath of god uh going down a catamaran in the like the Miami river and then we were able to make that happen and then we made sure that everything was free so then we kind of had this prompt that people had to go and submit a review of the exhibition uh of the show that was up in order to get a, f a free ticket to the screening um, cause I think there was only like 33 seats and then uh, like our guest list just made it. So there were only actually like 10. <laughs> it was more, but I, I don't, but we didn't get that many actually, like, I think we only got like seven or eight reviews. That's why I'm just like, so that's Emily Mello and she is actually the one that gave us this wonderful opportunity. <laughs> I want, uh, that's interesting. I've been wanting to figure out a way to sort of parcel in this particular question. Uh, there was a time when there was a travesty for this guy, Carlos Gonzalez, Russian czar lag, he performed, and I, I made this public outcry, and at the time, Domingo could respond on the social media platform, and he said, uh, 
if you don't like those institutions or those systems, create your own. And I've been thinking about that all day. And when you mentioned that, how did like the more institutional settings take to what you were doing? Do you feel like there was a, a support? I mean, obviously in this instance there was, but when okay. you create your own social institution that's more loosely defined, how did that work within the structures that existed in that city? Okay, so um, before we did this thing at the museum, we were just working with others in the in the city, right? So we would just use space and kind of like just mine people and, and work with people, develop ideas that way. But then after that, everyone that wanted to, to work with us didn't even come close to providing the kinds of resources we actually needed to do something like that again, right? So there was just like a, you know, we were given a, like, an excessive amount of res of money to do the programming we did in those six months. But that's actually what things cost. So then that really changed the way that we kind of move forward after that, because we weren't interested in working for free for any other institution um, in that way, you know? I think this is an example of something that we, we started doing after, after the, the PAM, which is just get a generator and do shows outside you know, and just have more music shows. And I think that was a, a vector towards um, music communities because it just felt more, I don't know. Alive? The time. Huh? Alive a bit? Yeah. Or, or... It was also a bit circumstantial with the generator. Yeah. You know, like the generator meant I can go anywhere. <laughs> 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 and we could be like on the water <laughs> having a show. Um, but I, I think... So we also had a pirate radio and an online radio station. And um, in that sense, I worked with d varying institutions there uh, in Miami and abroad. And that kind of gave a certain funding. Um, but I, th and working with them, I think like what working with Emily and the Miami Art Museum at that moment did for us was like put us in a position where we had to like really professionalize um we had a moment where we faced each other and it was like we needed the description the image the like bio you know and it was like i think if we would have done that for every event we did there was just no time like we had no time um i was working a full-time job you know like and we were doing like i mean i think at the end we did like over 400 events in like five years um and that's it was a massive amount of work and um so what happened is it's like there was a refusal to play that game right you know and and, and i inevitably end up going to masters get my masters and inevitably i'm here living in new york you know, essentially assimilating, as like I would like to call it, like why do collectives die? It's a lot of art collectives die, I think, in part because of certain pressures. Um, and at least ours, like we did not want to to really professionalize and like maybe become a nonprofit would have meant for us to lose some of like the charm of the space, right? Yeah, I mean, even it just required an address. And that became something we didn't even... No, no, I had an address, hon. That was, <laughs> that's all you, babe. <laughs> so, it's, so, I mean, just for clarity's sake, it's when you say, why, why do collectors die? Uh, so the end spring break is dead. I mean, we haven't... Or is it resting? No, it's, it's done. It's like, done. that project right. can't exist outside of that. I, we've had other projects yeah. together. But yeah, we've been doing other stuff together, yeah. but that doesn't make... It doesn't make sense. It's not making sense. That's, that's yeah. the thing. It's just like... At that moment, it like made general sense. Practice, yeah. yeah. At that moment, it makes sense. After that moment, it, it became really hard to just kind of continue doing these things, you know? And it felt so good to pay people, you know, and that, like, to to move away from from that and not be able to, you know, like, that's tough. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Your computer. Oh, the cable. Oh, the cable, huh? Yeah, babe. So these are some of our flyers. Yeah, these are some flyers. So let's go through. Let's go through some of it. Um, that's a flyer. There's a pool party. Did you play that, that time? Me? 
I don't swim. This is Laz. another this person is who was absolutely kind of life-changing and galvanizing of how people operated um, that, that party. Yeah, I was this party, yeah, this dick party. I think there's a picture of that party. There What's going on there? Oh, yeah. So that was the other thing the that we had. What's going on there? I, I, I think I was like one of the first Instagram users, and I had this like documentation of all this stuff. And then I think I got someone, I think I had tits on there, and someone flagged me. And, and then I didn't know what to do, so I deleted it. So, like, a lot of our event documentation is really, really crappy. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I want to, I would like to pause here yeah. for a second just because. Uh, is this at the at that bank? This is at the yeah, bank. Yeah, so, this is so, at a bank. <laughs> so I think this is something that like uh, all every major metropolitan city and then every city that tries to follow the lead of those is trying to like this this bank was and this empty. was the teller. If you see right. like the, he, the DJ essentially is behind is the teller. The circumstances <laughs> of the city allowed for this to happen en masse. So, like, yeah. all this extra space, all yeah. the extra space where you were able to allocate it for these projects, I mean, this is not this is, this is insane. Is it even possible, what? The 2008, like, this, so this is what happens. This is also yeah. how general practice functions, and that's a whole other uh, can of worms that's beautiful. We'll do that. But no, but no, but that's what I'm saying. It's like all this extra space just starts amassing, and then. But no, it's before 2008. Downtown was a, our downtown was a dead zone, and developers had already bought it, and were looking to start transforming it, but needed the hype, in order to bring people in. So who did they work with? They worked with like an art and public places thing, and this we get this bank because I was doing a online radio station called The End, <laughs> us. In, I was doing it every day in the front, you know, it's in like it had like the office, the private office in the front and then the, the bank. And I was doing it in the not so private, but private office. Um, yeah, yeah I, I just I just feel like uh, it seems like such a given when you have to sort of operate through any kind of DIY ethos. But the circumstances the, by which we're living in, I think it's more of a rarefied uh, potential. So it's, it's beautiful. I'd love to go in there. That's me. Yeah, too. Uh, for I think two years we um, hosted the green room at INC, which is which a, is international yeah noise an international conference. noise conference host uh, organized and hosted by Rap Bastard that takes place at Churchill's Pub, um, and we worked with I think yeah we worked with Nick yeah Treasure Teeth played yeah Miguel um, Alvarino yeah Miguel played Brad played some songs I think the second year Patty was already at school and she was just like. FaceTimed the whole time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we can keep this one moving. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> this is this artist that um, a gallerist called Clayton Deutsch had a space called the Sidewalk, Sidewalk Poetry Collective. No, Sidewalk Poetry Club. No, it was something else like structural. There's like three names. Yeah. Anyway, he had, he, he, had, he had an exhibition he had a, that um, was curated by another artist that invited three other artists, and one of them was Ed Lehan, and we hosted this project that he ended up doing, I think maybe a year or two later at Rena Spallings, where he just made like a, a trough of mojito, and everyone drank it, and that was it. I'm going to just go back really quick, because I think I want to, what we'll also describe our interest is talking through this project with Nick Lobo. Um, oh yeah, this yeah. project was great. So it is... It's a cell phone store that sold Peruvian pottery as well. So Nick wanted, what he wanted to do is flip it. Rather than it being a cell phone store, it was a Peruvian pottery store that just so happened to sell. So he made, he made some artworks that are here in the back. He took this photograph, but then at the same time, um, this artist, Jay Hines, had a record label called Agari, and he released, it was like the release of Nick, Nick's tape, and Nick had also done a book with another public, another kind of project in town by G. Moreno uh, called Name Publications, and it was a release of both of these things, 
a liquidation sale because the cell phone store was going out of business. And it was just like a, yeah, like a happy hour pop up. So it was just open for like a few hours. Was this around, this is before the internet cafe. Yeah, yeah, this is 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So in that sense, it's like, I think, you know, bringing it back to this idea of the city, right? Like I, for us, I, Miami was a, like, we had the ability that Miami could be anything we wanted. Like we could respond to like just different facets of the city. And, and for me, it's like, what's been really nice about reflecting on some of these ideas, especially in a city like New York, where everything feels like so formalized. You have so many art worlds, you know, you have many commercial galleries. I haven't seen too many, uh, independent like collectives pop up in a while like you know it's it's a hard you know forget like between rent and, and work and then producing artwork um, I am I'm not an artist I love supporting artist visions um, but in that sense I, I do come from I think I, I approach projects from an artist standpoint um, but like thinking about how like where is experimentation today like how can this type of world like how can this type of project what what would it look like to happen today stuff that i think about like how can we begin to play with experimental ways of learning that are collective versus this like very much like you know individual centered um oh look at that i didn't realize there was another one is this still, yeah, no, we're... No, no, we can... Oh, well, no, we can go... We did uh, several events on an artist named Misael Soto, his beach towel. He had a... I think, how, how big was his it's beach It's like towel? 60 by 30 feet. He took it on tour, and we kicked off his tour in Miami. Um, this is the generators. Oh, yeah, my generators. We use for the events. <laughs> Oh, this one. So yeah, we worked with this uh, pirate radio station, 97.7, and these the speaker stack is something they only bring out every Martin Luther King Jr. Day parade, like the, the parade that they do in Liberty City. So they, they would just like, this is a quarter of their stack because their stack goes down an entire like city block. So they brought it to the PAM, and then we invited them to DJ kind of the closing party. And then these are like part of the outdoor, speaking of like going back to the generator, we would, and what isn't really depicted here is the view that we see, I think, which is for me the most important part. It's like we were having, there was a show and what you were seeing was the water, you know, was like, you know, cityscape. cityscape. Yeah. Um, and that for me was I really important to the series was that to always be in a position where you were looking at water and where water somehow played a role in whatever the musicians sound artists were doing and we i ha actually do have some documentation of this that has that um because it was important it was important for me to mm -hmm. i mean it's still kind of shitty with my little point and shoot but <laughs> it worked you want me to go back to that one brad that was brad um what else comes can we okay do you have any questions before I keep? I yeah. Do you have questions, going? Nick? Come on, give me. Give or me does some anybody reflection. from anybody have a? I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you know, you said. Oh Jesus! You said uh, this thing about it feels really good uh, to pay people, and obviously it feels very good to be paid. Uh, on the other hand, is there anything to be said? Uh, any kind of ruminations or reflections on the way that this exchange operated when you had budgets versus when you didn't like the actual sort of communal exchange of whatever sort of cultural resources and you know you created a platform and a way that people could form they could they could they could it was a hub of sorts and in, you know obviously a nomadic one but you know like i have done both kinds of projects with you and honestly either it, it didn't really matter to me at the time. I was just so stoked that there was something to be doing. So I'm curious, like, you know, that exchange, complications, things that felt good. 
Oh, that. Okay, yeah. So the, the, something that happened in the later things, in the later projects, was that people expected us to be much more professional than we were. There was this kind of like our optics kind of outgrew our reality. Um, so it was always a kind of, we had to bring people back to earth. Like, oh, actually, we have no money. I don't know. You're thinking of doing all this stuff, but you're going to have to figure out what that means and how to do it and clean it up. Like we can help you, but there's not some. There's only so much we can do. Um, so then it became really about understanding what is the. You know, you're kind of just workshopping these ideas with people about like what is it that you're really trying to do, and how do you do it with nothing, or how do you what 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 are the most essential things you need in order to get this completed or in order to get this done, um, and other times it was like, hey, we have this space. I remember you talking about this idea. Do you want to pursue that? Do you want to kind of like go about doing that you know I what I will say though that I feel I think really affected the way I in which I work with artists to this day that I learned through working uh, through doing this space was what exactly what you're saying is it's the way in which I build relationships like I built strong lasting relationships through this project and that for me was at the forefront of everything that exactly. I was doing um, and it was like to a certain degree I consider myself a curator now but to a certain degree I don't necessarily like it wasn't about this like phenomenal project that someone came to me with it's actually about like I really value and see something in this person you know and I want to support what their vision and help them work it out and think through it and and give provide a space where you don't have to sit there and give me a proposal um i may not be giving you i i can give you my feedback and i can give you a space and i can help to do certain things but i you know and you know i would give what i what i could yeah that, that's what yeah we would just meet up probably at a bar with them and then just sit yeah. down and just like work work it all out pretty loosely you know I do have another specific question because this is the second time that you mentioned this delineation of your role as not an artist. And I would say, for me, I find it very interesting because, again, when I was able to access what y'all were doing, I looked at you as artists. And so at a very young age, I was able to assess that there's a material reality by which those delineations were like way less important because it was the role of creating and making an action occur or not an action or any kind of event. And that to me is essentially the groundwork of sort of the conceptual parameters of this show and the kind of work that I'm interested in generally. So I am kind of curious, like, I know it's like a drastic shift from the last sort of labor exchange conversation, but I I, I mean, this is this is very, very interesting to me because we've never talked about it. Wait, say that again. He's, I didn't fully it, grasp the, it. The role of, well. I don't see a difference between curator in this context, what it did, what the end created for me, and I think a lot of other people, was that it wasn't about, oh, these curators are curating me into a show. It was like these artists are using curation as a model by which we are in an exchange as a community. And that, to me, set the platform for how something like this works. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I don't, like, we played your videos today, we played your audio. And now we're talking about this curatorial practice. And for me, I don't, I, what that engendered in me was that there's no need for this compartmentalization of form. That's maybe another, for me, there's no need for this compartmentalization. So that's what I'm asking. Yeah, and I think that's a really great, great question. Um, so I, I think it's, and I'm going to answer from more of like a, a personal standpoint, but um, my experience. Um, I went to art school, I left art school, and for me, I turned, instead of making art, I took the space that I was given from, my school gave us studios, they got a studio space from developers, <laughs> and, I, and I, got a, I got a studio space that had a really huge um, exhibition space downstairs. And instead of making art, I turned to this and started doing this. And I, and I, you know, a lot of people, going back to also like the education, right? Like this understanding of what a curatorial practice can be and the possibilities within that, I think I never really, I, I was never taught, so I really didn't know. 
and um yeah i feel so, like that happened years late like we got to that years yeah. after and there we was, started i think f- the most important aspect though was the hierarchy um like the way a curator for me at a museum was so untenable like they were just so far away there was like you know if you got to them then the artist got the show and like that type of hierarchy made me feel really uncomfortable because it's like a power dynamic that i think that i just didn't really want to play into um so part of this like refusal during that time there was a refusal because a lot of artists that i went to school with be like oh so you're a curator now and i was like no you know but then it's like what am i doing you know, and, and I respect the artist practice, right? Like artists spend day in and day out thinking about their practice and their art. And I was doing a curator stuff, you know, like I was organizing exhibitions, doing a lot of that type of admin, reading about shows, like reading about how to work in collectives. Like I was researching versus actually practicing an art practice. Like I wasn't at home. Like I, um, I was also doing social work at the time too. And that took me through another spin but um like I wasn't practicing art you know and that for me I that delineation I think to a certain degree is like important like I only practice and I only make things in a collaborative setting I'm glad I never knew that because we wouldn't be on the stage now because your delineation are that makes total sense uh for me I just thought you were an artist and this was the, the practice you were after, so that's, that's great to know. Um, I would be remiss to continue the conversation without asking about highlighting some of uh, Lazaro Rodriguez's uh, work, if there's any documentation in there. I think we're having another HDMI problem. I think we, what is no, this, St. It it Petersburg? It's just a thing, man. So this is Washington, D.C.? Yeah, I don't know. Do you want to talk about that? About Laz for a second? Yeah. Yeah. So Lazaro was a artist and photographer in town who was working th- with zines, had, was showing a lot of work outside of Miami through just like online networks, um, put Nick in this show. And we met Laz through Dana Bassett and Matt because they had put out a zine of his. And this was kind of like a compendium of both the release of the zine and an exhibition that he organized. It was his first publication. This and and, and taking that first publication, he had, and very generously invited other people to participate to frame the world around this this publication. It was very nice. And again, I guess this this is a theme that keeps coming up. While he is a photographer, the dick parties exist within your again your constellation of of efforts and it's this continuous like well what what is defining what what is you know what i mean like this duplicity multiplicity of practice and and you know yeah we also did another um we did a screensaver with lazaro as well um and then we had a like an a closing reception of the screensaver at an at an internet cafe in Miami Beach where we just put it on all the computers and that's it they were just kind of like no one was using the the computers so the screens were just kind of cycling through Laz's photographs and that was like another vibe absolutely wonderful should we take a tour through more of these slides as you I mean I think we're at least on our end, unless you have more questions. We're coming to a close. I've asked all my questions. Does anybody have anything, really, anybody have anything they'd like to ask or mention? or Carlos. So, um, with, uh, it's a particular moment in time, whether 2009 plays a role in the collapse economically or not. Is something like this, pos- I, I feel something like this is not possible in Miami now, right? Most and most cities as well. So what are, what are the kind of conditions that have to kind of exist around it for it to happen? Because I'm curious how, and it's cyclical, right? Something yeah. else could happen and now, now it's here again, but something on that. Yeah, I mean, gosh, I feel like that's like a question that I can't answer without 
speaking like it being a group answer versus like my own thoughts but um i think that's partially what i've what i've been thinking a lot about in terms of new york like where like where is that space for experimentation in this sense like what really did really well for us was the no space like not having that overhead like we did not have to pay rent on on a space um but we managed to get space time in and time out you know, um, and, then, and there was just more free time. Yeah. Well, I I was working You're... full time. <laughs> <laughs> you were, but you left early a lot. I mean, no, 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 just no. You... I just. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, no, no. But go back to the conditions because that's the more interesting. Yeah, I think it's just like. Uh, a space and time thing, you know, where back then, for some reason, there was just, I mean, things were just, le- there was less pressure financially on everyone. So you just had more free time to kind of like experiment and mess around and like really think through things that I feel is very hard to come by now. I also think there's an increasingly like the idea of professionalization. I think there's like it's I see the art world now as an industry, you know, um, and it was an industry back then, too. Um, so, you know, it's like in my in my own way, it's like don't get that twisted. Um, but like that idea of now we're in that machine and we have to like there is a standard that you perform to right like so how like this type of space which was messy but yet you know we worked with a museum right like can't you know like we weren't subscribing necessarily to um certain modes of professionalization but yet we managed to kind of across that so it's like can that exist now it's like i feel a little skeptical but maybe i'm wrong it can it's just i don't know if the interest to experiment like that is there because i know the one thing that we were really talking about is just like what are the bottom lines right we don't need a space we cut our overhead what does that allow us to do and then just like a simple website like just documenting things enough to make it look very real right so there was this whole kind of like um it doesn't exist, there's no physical space, but this website makes it very real and it looks very professional to a certain degree. It's just like, it's just giving you all the information you need. So it was almost like having a real easy bottom line of what we need these things to do in order for it to kind of, in order for us to kind of really um, utilize the material as free as possible, I guess, you know? So next question, is it important for an artist practice Not industry, but maybe the arts in general. Can I piggyback I on, so. on that and add, is there an age by which that works at best? No. Well, everything now feels like even if you're older or younger, it's just a fucking business model, right? It's just like, I'm going to just, it's a fucking startup and nothing's about um, fucking up, you know, you can't fuck up. There's no space to fuck up, you know? And even just like the first picture you take on the Instagram, you start for the thing you're doing is just like ready to go, you know, and any kind of humanity you can show is also performative. So there's like, what kind of space do you even have to... Um, exist in outside of those frameworks, you know, like you're immediately framed no matter what you do. 
At 35, I will not be uh, in a noose in my underpants uh, versus when I was... You're not going to go there again? Come on. Come on. Relive. relive. Not, what not, what not about the public. retrospective? Not you got to relive it. Not in public. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Truly, this whole thing I owe to Sarah, Carlos, Domingo, and Patty in, in a big way. And I really appreciate all of you being here. And I thank you for your time. Thank you all. For and uh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you very much. That Thank was you. fun. That Thank was a lot you. of fun. That is a, what do you call that? That is an interactive performance, right? We can, uh, <laughs> when you know, you know, when you start the project up again, you can interview me about uh, that. And then there we're good. Thank you very much. <laughs>